Hi, this is Millie Kay, and it's Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. And the subject of this video is the Oroville Dam Diversion Tunnels. I've provided information about the diversion tunnels in many of my other videos, but for this one, I want to focus exclusively on the tunnels. And the photo you're seeing now is of a temporary canal that the Feather River waters moved through at the core block of the dam before the diversion tunnels were operational. Now I want to start out by saying if the Edward Hyatt power plant shuts down because the reservoir level drops below 640 feet in elevation, the river valve outlet system in tunnel number two is the only means to release the remaining 850,000 acre feet of water from the reservoir. And since the dam was completed and the reservoir was originally filled, its lowest elevation occurred in November of 2014, when the level was at 647 feet. And as I'm making this video, the elevation of the reservoir is only 20 feet above that at 667 feet. So let's get to know these tunnels. There are two diversion tunnels under the dam and they've always been known as diversion tunnel number one and diversion tunnel number two. I'll show some photos of their construction. Their first purpose was to divert water, um, uh, the waters of the Feather River around the construction site while the dam was being built. Tunnel number one was completed in November 1963 and tunnel number two was completed in November 1964, just in time for the devastating Christmas flood that would occur the following month. And the tunnels are 35 feet in diameter and over 4,400 feet in length, or more than three-fourths of a mile. And they're lined with high-strength concrete. Well, let's look at the tunnel inlets. The two tunnels are built into the left abutment of the dam. That's on your left if you're looking downstream from the reservoir. And they're about 70 or 80 feet apart. At their inlets, the invert or interior bottom of the tunnel number one is at 210 feet elevation. And the invert for tunnel number two is at 230 feet. They were built to handle flows of as much as 190,000 cubic feet per second. And as you can see, tunnel number one has a different uh, inlet structure. Its rectangular shape transitions into a circular inlet, just like the other tunnel, but they needed to install bulkhead gates on this one so they could close the gates and dewater the tunnel when they put the permanent concrete plug in it and started to fill the reservoir. There are concrete plugs 150 feet in length in both tunnels, starting at about 1,800 feet in from these inlets. And in the plug in tunnel number two, there's a system of valves that let water go through to the other side of the dam. It's called the river valve outlet system, and I'll tell you more about that a little later in the video. And tunnel number two didn't need closure gates because it's placed 20 feet higher and they were able to put the plug in it and install the valve system before they closed off tunnel number one and began to fill the reservoir. As a matter of fact, they started running the river valve system immediately after tunnel number one was plugged. That was the first purpose of the river valve system to make downstream releases until the water reached the penstock intake level and the Edward Hyatt power plant could operate. And they also knew it could serve as an alternative in the future if the power plant was not able to function for any reason. And tunnel number two now has a concrete trash rack at its intake face to guard the river valve system from submerged debris. There's also an auxiliary intake for the valve system at elevation 340. It has a concrete trash rack and is connected to tunnel number two by an 18 foot diameter shaft to supply water to the river valve system in case the intake tunnel gets closed by silt. Now let's talk about that flood that happened. When both diversion tunnels were complete, 
but had not yet been plugged. The devastating Christmas flood of 1964 took place, and this flood greatly affected the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. And as you can see in this photo that was taken December 23rd, which was one of the biggest uh, flood days of that storm and flood, it, uh, this is the unfinished dam. Back here is, there's no reservoir yet because they haven't started filling it, but these are the floodwaters of the Feather River coming in on its tributaries and forks. And it comes in and goes through those inlets of the diversion tunnel through the dam and out right here into the Thermalito diversion pool. And you can see their outlets here barely and I have a couple more photos taken on that same day of the diver diversion tunnels discharging the water and records indicate that the water was flowing through the tunnels at approximately 157,000 cubic feet per second here's another photo on that same day So that's what uncontrolled flood water is gushing through the diversion tunnels looks like. Now I want to fast forward to 2018 so I can show you the outlet portals. So under more normal conditions, this is what the outlet portals look like. And the invert elevation for tunnel number one's outlet, which is over here on the left, is 182 feet, um, so its outlet opening stays underwater. And tunnel number two's invert elevation is 207.5 feet. So with the diversion pool being at 225 feet elevation, which it usually is, the water covers about half of its opening. And this tunnel has trash racks that can be lowered to filter out debris when they're doing the reverse pump operation to send water back into the reservoir. The Hyatt power plant maximizes power production through a pump storage operation where water can be returned to the reservoir in off-peak periods and used to generate power during peak power demands. And when the powerhouse is doing the reverse pump operation, this diversion pool becomes a four bay for the turbines as the water goes into tunnel number two and is pumped back up to the reservoir. And as I said, the, term, the Sermolito diversion pool is normally kept at approximately 225 feet in elevation, and I'll show you why. If we look at this map that shows the dam is up here in the upper right corner, and then we have the diversion pool, which is the Feather River, but it's called the diversion pool until it gets to the diversion dam about mm, over four miles from those outlet portals of the diversion tunnels. And then at the diversion dam, the water can go down the Feather River or they can divert it over through the power canal to the four bay. And it also can go from the four bay on to the after bay. And there's a pumping and generating plant there that can uh, generate power and then pump the water back as well. But for now, I just want to focus on these three features, the four bay, the power canal, and the diversion pool. Because they all work together and transfer water back and forth, particularly during the reverse pump operation, it's critical that that level of all three of these stays at of that 225 foot uh, level. Now, I wanna show you a photo that was taken in February of 2017. This was about, this was on the 27th of February or about two weeks after the spillway incident happened. And it shows the debris that came down into the Thermalito diversion pool. It caused the water level in the diversion pool 
to rise significantly as it was filling that channel and backing up toward the diversion tunnels. And that would ultimately damage the powerhouse and make it inoperable. So if I can show you the, here's the diversion tunnels. They're pretty full. Um, and the Department of Water Resources has estimated that approximately 2.2 million cubic yards of rock, concrete fragments, and hillside were eroded and deposited in the diversion pool during that event. They removed about half that amount in the first stage of the recovery, and they were able to save the powerhouse so it could be put into operation to further lower the reservoir. Now, let's look at a schematic as a sort of overview of what we've been looking at in the photos. Here's the two tunnels and the powerhouse. We have tunnel number one down at the bottom, tunnel number two, they each have their concrete plugs and the river valve system is here within this concrete plug of tunnel number two. We have six turbines, four of them discharge into tunnel number one, two of them discharge into tunnel number two, as does the river valve outlet system. And that river valve outlet system basically consists of two 72 inch diameter conduits through the tunnel plug that are controlled by two 54 inch fixed cone dispersion valves each of which is guarded by a 72 inch spherical valve. And the outlet system has a maximum capacity of 5,400 cubic feet per second when the reservoir is at 640 foot in elevation. But its capacity of course goes down as the elevation of the water decreases. And during power generation, the maximum discharge for tunnel number one is 12,000 cubic feet per second because it picks up the flows from those four turbine units. And the maximum flow in tunnel number two is 6,000 cubic feet per second since two units discharge through it. But not all six turbines are present all the time. They routinely take one of them out on a rotating basis for maintenance and repair. And the maximum total output, if all six turbines were to be in operation, is 16,950 cubic feet per second, or a little under 3,000 for each turbine. And remember, three of the turbines are capable of reverse pumping. And there's a system of tunnels for the powerhouse, and some of them connect to tunnel number two. One of the things that's not shown here is the core block access tunnel, which can convey seepage water from the core block to tunnel number two if the drainage pumps for that seepage were to fail. So let's go to this cutaway graphic. So should the reservoir drop below that critical 640 foot level and the Edward Hyatt power plant has to shut down the river valve outlet system, shown in this cutaway graphic, will be doing all the work to bring the water from the reservoir through diversion tunnel number two and on into the Feather River. The normal rainy season for the watershed starts in September, so some significant rainfall could of course replenish the diminishing resources. The system was put into service in 1967. It's had some problems over the years, but between 2012 and 2016, they did extensive inspections and testing. They replaced this baffle ring, which is an energy dissipator that calms down the water as it's discharged through this chamber. And they refurbished and or replaced the bows and hydraulic systems they updated and relocated the monitoring and control functions so that it operates now remotely from the turbine deck in the powerhouse. Now this concludes my video and I want to thank 
you for, I, I want to thank everybody for viewing my video and I especially want to thank my subscribers. I appreciate every view and subscription and I want to say another special thank you to those of you who have donated to my channel. That's awesome. I hope you will like, subscribe, and share and I'll see you later.